Well, let's get started. Uh, I guess our speaker today, I know, is Brandon. Uh, maybe you saw him yesterday at the Natural History Museum. Anyway, Brandon comes to us from the University of New Mexico. Before that, he's a postdoc at Caltech, and before that, he was a student here. Okay, he's been doing very well for himself. Uh, he stays very busy doing lots of things. And um, when I asked him what kind of introduction he wanted, he said, oh, you can keep it brief. <laughs> so uh, uh, he was a student with me, and I enjoyed him greatly. It's, it's wonderful to see him move on and do well in the world. Um, but I'll let him tell you about Mount St. Helens. Yes. <laughs> Thanks. Well, it's uh, definitely a pleasure to get to uh, come back to Eugene, and uh, it's been really exciting to see what a lot of students are doing here. It's an entirely different group of students since um, I've been back in Eugene, and also um, great to see so much new research going on and a lot pointed at um, volcanology. So. Uh, hopefully an appropriate view of it today. Uh, I'm going to look at Mount St. Helens and this is um, work that's linked to Cascadia being a geoprisms focus site. I think a lot of you are, are familiar with the geoprisms program, but geoprisms is an NSF program and where it's a little bit different than our disciplinary programs, things like geophysics or geochemistry or others, is that um, it's trying to get scientists from different directions, whether they're um, field mapping or, or chemical analyses or, or modeling or any, any sorts of studies to all focus on different, um, on one part of the plate margin. And they focus on subduction and rift systems. And so this focus site, the Cascadia focus site for the past several years has been one of their subduction sites. And within it, um, there's been a, a large group working on Mount St. Helens. And, um, so that large group includes a lot of people. Um, I'm mostly going to focus on um, the, the work that we've done with a subset of the seismic array, and I'll try and put that in context. Um, and so much of that work is from uh, a postdoc at UNM who's now on the faculty at Macquarie University, uh, Steve Hansen, and then uh, Margaret Glasgow, who is a graduate student at the University of New Mexico. And there are many contributions from other folks, other institutions that were involved in the experiment, and so I'll try to uh, mention them as, uh, as we go. Um, the way this is cast um, is kind of a story, um, in that it's a story of kind of how I ended up doing some of this research in addition to the results that we're finding. And so um, by kind of an unusual path, um, I think I ended up doing research on Mount St. Helens by way of oil and gas industry data from Long Beach, California. Um, and so I'll, I'll kind of show um, sort of the motivations of that, but um, I, I think we can start there and then start to look at bringing this sort of a, a large number of elements or a large seismic array to a subduction zone volcano and then focus on some of the early results from St. Helens. So, um, where I would start then is to think about um, seismic arrays. And if you look at an area like Southern California here, the greater Los Angeles area, kind of an important place and a, a um, place with a rich history of seismic monitoring. This is one of the nicer seismic observatories in the world. And it's made out of those black triangles that are broadband stations spaced maybe 15 or so kilometers apart. All right, so that's, that's pretty good coverage. Inside it, that gray blob is actually 5,000 independent dots that are um, nodal seismic, uh, an oil and gas service company out of Long Beach. Their 3D array that was deployed in 2011. And so that's, that's really getting to be a seismic array, right? This is the Long Beach Airport runway here. Um, this is the, the 405, the busiest interstate in the country, the busiest port in the country is here, two million people live inside the array, it's a, it's a speck of earth almost carpeted in seismometers, so it's, it's pretty beautiful to look at. Um, and, and you know, how do we go from having one lonely station in here to having this sort of array and what could we do with it? Um, I found it kind of inspiring to, to work with some of those data. Of course, um, why it's there is um, not for researching volcanoes, 
um, but that this is deployed along the crest of the Long Beach Anacline, which is kind of a, a classic oil and gas um, trap, this sort of anacline structure that um, focuses oil ascending um, beneath the crest of the anacline. Um, there are just as many wells in Long Beach today. They're a little bit less conspicuous than they were in the past, um, but it, it makes for uh, a great photo. Um, so it's, it's really that, that economic pressure that was driving this array. Um, but what's incredible to me about it, if you want to think about you know, what's another study of Mount St. Helens, how many times will we, we look more at Mount St. Helens? Well, this, this oil field's been studied since the late 1920s. And it's been producing continuously. There are more than 10,000 holes in the ground in an area that's 10 kilometers by 7 kilometers. And in 2011, they wanted to spend millions of dollars to learn more about 3D structure in the upper crust. Um, so at Mount St. Helens, since its eruption in 1980, we've had on average about 10 seismometers monitoring that area. And we certainly don't have thousands of holes in the ground or um, anything else at the level of the instrumentation here. So it's a very hard problem to actually know as much as we might want about, say, how fluids are moving beneath the surface um, and the, the 3D structure of a region. So um, kind of sobering to think that that long after they're still trying to understand this place. Uh, so what makes this kind of thing feasible, jumping from one seismometer to 5,000 in, in Long Beach? Um, it's fairly simple. You have some of these gadgets um, in Amanda Thomas's lab here, um, nicer, newer ones, actually. This is um, what we could call an autonomous or cable-free seismograph. Seismograph just meaning the whole package, everything we need. So the seismometer itself is a, is a passive one, a geophone. So this is exactly the mass on a spring you'd see in intro physics. And this mass on a spring has a conductive coil that's moving over a magnet, and it's going to generate a current proportional to the velocity at which it's moving up and down. Um, so this is a pretty simple machine. Aside from that, we need a GPS clock. Um, we need a, a, a way to digitize that signal that has high dynamic range, um, a battery, and uh, a, a hard drive in there. And so in this case, this was an instrument that was only a vertical component, geophone. Um, here you have a, a facility um, for three component geophones. These only had a two-week battery life. Battery lives are, are up to a month now. So um, things are going in a good direction. Um, where this is actually kind of revolutionary for oil and gas is that it, in, it enabled collecting data in um, places that were otherwise prohibitive. And so you could think of the other way to deploy um, thousands of channels of data on land. And this is fine if there's nothing but, say, grassland around and you can string miles of cable, but you can't do this in a place where two million people live. Um, you also can't do this um, in rugged topography, things like a volcanic landscape. I assure you I would not have gotten my permit at Mount St. Helens National Monument if I wanted to string miles of cable there. Um, so there are just some simple practical um, obstacles that um, this kind of gets us over to have these cable-free, rapidly deployable systems. So what could we see if we jumped up to this? Um, it's a video that seismologists have seen a whole lot um, in, in recent years. This is from uh, Rob Clayton at Caltech. And on the left is just one snapshot of it. And on the right, you're seeing this, this earthquake wave field start to propagate across the Long Beach 3D array. And the earthquake in this case, if I can keep my hand steady, uh, would have started right about here, just a few kilometers outside the array, about a magnitude 3 earthquake. And you see this thing ripple across the array, array um, the, the P waves moving fast at the beginning, the coda there at the end. Um, obviously a lot of information in that, that if you have one wiggly line from the one Southern California network station here, you wouldn't know nearly as much about that wave field. Some of the things that um, I find sort of striking or a little bit scary about it is that we could look at this. This is only now five or six kilometers from the source, and you see that upward motion, or red, is separated from downward motion across basically a city block in Long Beach. And that's not a nodal plane from the focal mechanism, if you're thinking that. That's actually that the wave field has already been dissected by um, regional structure, basically, by contrast and velocity across the Newport Inglewood fault zone. Um, 
So this wave field's been distorted enough that you have upward motion right next to downward where you wouldn't predict it if you didn't know in great detail the, the regional structure. Um, you can think about other ways to apply this. Um, these are just raw amplitudes. But this is the maximum ground acceleration during that earthquake. Sure, it's red on the left, closer to the earthquake, and it gets weaker on the right. Um, but there are also sort of city block scale variations in this. What's, what's causing those variations in the amplitude of these seismic waves? Um, we certainly wouldn't be able to characterize that correctly if we only had stations every, say, 15 kilometers apart. So you can start to um, get some gears spinning in the mind, especially among seismologists. What are the kinds of things you'd like to be able to do with these instruments? Um, no one would be too surprised that you could see a magnitude 3 earthquake from a few kilometers away with geophones. That, that's, not, um, that's not unexpected by any means. Um, where I've done a lot of my work with these instruments is um, kind of below the corner frequency of the sensors. So they're mass spring systems, meaning they have a natural frequency of, of 10 hertz. And as you go lower than that, um, you start to have um, weaker sensitivity. This is a case where we're looking at um, less than one hertz seismic waves, so an order of magnitude below the corner frequency. And in the same way, red motions are up, blue motions are down. And here we're looking at uh, a very large source, the magnitude 9 Tohoku earthquake in 2011. But this is its P wave, which would have refracted through the deep earth and come up nearly vertical um, beneath Long Beach. And you can still see the crest of that P wave moving across this array. So an order of magnitude below the corner, we're, we're picking up useful signal. Um, the same would be true in, in background ambient noise data. You can use that down to something like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 hertz on these instruments that are, are 10 hertz geophones. So there's probably a lot of different things you could do with these. And um, I ended up pursuing these, these teleseismic P waves to study sort of the, the tectonic boundary at the edge of um, the inner borderland in California, um, but that's pretty far from volcanoes, so um, I'm not going to get into that. What I brought all of that up for is just to say sort of how I ended up going in this direction, and it was that it motivated this question of how can I point this kind of seismic array at an active volcanic system, and I, I was hoping to get away with it pretty quickly. Um, so the way I was mainly thinking about this, is that most of our studies of volcanic systems, how we monitor them, we put out 10 stations, and we have these nice fancy sensors, just a few of them for a long time. Maybe if we had a whole bunch of cheap sensors instead of 10 fancy ones, we could get a different view of some aspects of a volcanic system, is, is really the main motivation. And so how to, um, how to get away with this, uh, this, this project called IMUSH, Imaging Magma Under St. Helens, was already planned, and one big aspect of it was this active source experiment. And they were going to take all these sensors that can re record for about 24 hours and install them as the blue dots and set off about half of the explosive sources, which are, are shallow buried, shallowly buried explosions, 10 to 20 meters deep, 1,000 or 2,000 pounds of uh, blasting gel. And then they were going to move all the blue dots to become the red dots and set off the other half of the explosions. Um, in the meantime, there were going to be very few stations in the wilderness right near Mount St. Helens, which seemed like um, kind of an interesting area in the study of Mount St. Helens. And so um, I called up Alan Lavander, who was the, the PI of the Active Source Project, and said, hypothetically, if I could find a way to show up with a thousand instruments that could record continuously, um, how would you feel about that? And um, he was uh, kindly uh, very supportive of the idea, and um, so I kind of jumped into the IMUSH project uh, very late, really just in the last couple months. Part of the reason that I would bring that up is um, if you see something like this, often you know people really are rooting for you as more senior scientists in the field. It's worth um, trying it, at least um, exploring a little bit if there's a, a way that it's possible, and in this case, um, the PIs were willing to bring sort of a different angle into the project, and um, NSF was willing to uh, discuss this as a potential rapid project where a small additional investment might um, bring quite a bit more from something they were already doing. So this is kind of an atypical proposition. Um, normally, a passive source seismologist would 
um, go dig some holes in the ground and put out stations for a couple of years to accumulate a lot of data to study an area. So what am I going to do with passive data? A lot of sensors, but still passive data mostly from uh, two weeks. Uh, I think the main reason they would have funded it is that it was one, cheap, and two, they knew they were paying far more for the explosives than they were for uh, my array. And so if you are going to bother to set off controlled sources, you might as well record the heck out of them. Um, so I think that's probably why I got to do it. And then we could think of other things we could start to do with um, continuous data at a place like Mount St. Helens. We might be able to do things like ambient noise interferometry. I won't talk about it much today, but we've used um, ambient noise surface waves to image structure at Mount St. Helens. We could look at micro seismicity that's going on. Uh, Mount St. Helens is seismically active among Cascade volcanoes, but um, maybe would, would pale compared to a lot of global systems. Um, maybe something like 15 earthquakes would be an average over the past five years. <coughs> We'd really like dense recordings of some of the more exotic sources that, um, that volcanoes have, exotic seismic sources, things like deep long period events. Um, but that's quite a gamble because they don't happen too much at Mount St. Helens. So um, before going farther, just a little bit of an intro to Mount St. Helens. Um, most of you probably know quite a bit about it. Um, at least several of you probably know quite a bit more than me. Um, but we'll, we'll kind of start with the basics. Um, the reason that, that Mount St. Helens is famous is its May 1980 eruption, um, coming up on uh, the anniversary of that shortly. About a third of a cubic kilometer ejected volume, uh, ash and gas up into the stratosphere, uh, lowered the summit by a few hundred meters, uh, blew out catastrophically to the north end of the volcano. Um, Mount St. Helens for Reference, um, this is not really necessary here, but is, is curiously located due west of another major arc volcano, Mount Adams. Since 1980, uh, Mount St. Helens has um, had a variety of activity. Um, 1980 to 86, um, frequent um, steam erupt, primarily steam eruptions and dome growth within the summit crater. So this would be sort of the view from the north looking to the south into the, the breach or the sort of horseshoe shaped crater of Mount St. Helens. And these things were pretty frequent up until about 1986. And there was a hiatus in um, uh, volcanic, volcanic activity at Mount St. Helens. Um, the most recent eruptive episode was 2004 to 2008. This is just one little bit of it, but this um, sort of fin-shaped chunk of, of day site is part of a larger dome that was extruded in the summit crater um, during those years, probably most active in about 2005. And so if you were to look at it, there are you know, all sorts of fantastic imagery of this thing from, from USGS, but this is sort of the, the, the new uh, day site dome growing through 2005. Um, sort of the spring of 2005, it was extremely active as it was going on at its margins. It was setting off um, millions of very small earthquakes as that plug was being extruded and um, greatly enlarged the, the dome inside the crater at Mount St. Helens. Um, cool to see it in the photo view. The DEM view is maybe um, a little bit better for synthesizing what was going on in the whole crater at the time. So we see that extrusion of the crater, and then there's also this stuff flowing around the side. Mount St. Helens hosts the only rapidly growing glacier in the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's so heavily shaded that it um, accumulates a lot of um, snow that can last through the next summer, and so has built up a glacier in the uh, 38 years since, um, since the major eruption. Um, so that's the most recent volcanic activity, and uh, many people ask why you know, IMUSH was focused on Mount St. Helens, and it's, it's not that there's been a recent change in the activity there, or that we're looking at a, a change in hazard. It's really that this system has been relatively well studied already, and we might be able to zoom in even farther and get a, a better handle on fundamental processes of arc volcanoes. Uh, from a seismic perspective, we were to just look at what might be going on for earthquake activity. This is kind of a summary plot that, that leaves off right when we deployed the array. Um, and so this just shows seismicity as a function of depth changing through time. Um, so it's mostly in the upper 10 kilometers in the years leading up to our um, experiment, mostly in the uppermost five. You'll notice um, 
there's this sort of stripe here. There is, is an area at about two or three kilometers depth that's um, unusually active. Um, we'll, we'll see that come up again uh, a little bit later. During this dome extrusion event, um, many, many earthquakes, very shallow. You don't see so many deep um, different opinions on that. There's probably a few missing ones down there if you're having to deal with millions of shallow earthquakes, but um, that, that gets debated some. Um, right, so moving forward in time, um, this is what uh, the group that I was leading was up to at Mount St. Helens. So these are the uh, expert crew up here, the 13 students from University of New Mexico and from uh, Portland State University and then two field technicians from Nodal Seismic. Uh, the first time any of this group had seen these instruments was the day before we started deploying them. We practiced uh, with a few on the uh, soccer field at Woodland Middle School. And this is what about a thousand nodes looks like. Um, and our, our goal was just over four days to install those before the shots started going off at Mount St. Helens. Let them sit for two weeks, record continuously for the two weeks, and then um, bring them back in and uh, collect the data. Um, field deployment went relatively smoothly. Many of you have had the opportunity to use some instruments like this for the most part. Um, beautiful trail system at Mount St. Helens if you've never encountered it. Um, making it around that mountain and going in and out of the blast zone is um, an enlightening experience for a geologist, I would say. Um, it's better if you're not scampering over the, the lava flows with a bunch of these in your backpack, but um, it still works. Basically, just plant this thing in the ground, um, one set of ports for data, one for power, and uh, tell the thing to wake up with a little handheld <coughs> electronic device and move on your way about a minute or two later. So they're pretty rapid to deploy. Mostly where we spend our time in this array is that um, greater than 60% of them were deployed along the backcountry trail system, some of them up to um, 10 to 15 kilometers from a trailhead. Um, so those were all, all 920 of those were carried in. Uh, what we ended up recording, um, some amount of luck there. Um, we definitely had all of the IMA shots, and that's more courtesy of Alan Lavander and Eric Kaiser and um, Steve Harder and his crew who um, coordinated the, the, the blasting and the permitting and everything went off without a hitch in that regard. Those are pretty big sources. They registered as magnitude 0.8 to two earthquakes on the, the local scale from PNSN. Um, so they were recorded up to uh, more than 200 kilometers away. So definitely clear signals within um, our seismic array. Um, surface wave noise interferometry worked quite well. We had 50 earthquakes detected by PNSN that were inside the array, which um, really is quite an opportunity in that case. Um, in comparison, the Long Beach Array was out for six months and had not one earthquake inside it that was detected by the Southern California Seismic Network. Um, many that have been detected using more sophisticated methods with 5,000 seismometers, um, but, but not anything big enough that it was um, detected from the normal network. And then we also caught two deep long period earthquakes. Um, so there's a chance to take a little more of a look at those. What the node array looked like, um, sort of this spider web geometry, which is dictated by everywhere that I was allowed to deploy them, uh, which was the backcountry trail system and the logging roads and national monument roads around Mount St. Helens. So sometimes in the talk, I'll refer to this part as sort of the inner ring. This is uh, the Lewitt Trail, or the innermost backcountry trail. And so that's kind of a radius of a few kilometers from the summit crater, and that's um, as close as we get. And then these other symbols are the, the permanent stations, which come in different uh, flavors. There are four borehole seismometers, there are some short periods, and there are some broadbands. Um, and so I'll, I'll mention some of those um, as I go. Um, we did have these earthquakes that PNSN would have detected, all the, the colorful dots here two deep long period earthquakes off to the southeast, and most of the seismicity clustered beneath the, the summit crater. And so we'll sort of zoom in on some of that. Um, so there are kind of a few different stories, starting with um, micro seismicity, or looking at the earthquakes beneath Mount St. Helens with, um, with this dense temporary array. 
And you could go through and try and um, pick earthquakes, uh, sort of visually, as seismologists might do. These are the five in a little segment of, of data that PNSN would have detected. So these are five relatively large earthquakes. And the way these seismograms are shown is just red up, blue down. And they're sorted by distance from the summit crater. Um, so distance increasing to the right from about 3 to um, 14 kilometers. And then time increasing downward, we have about two and a half minutes of data here when there was this little cluster of, of earthquakes. And one of the things that, that we aimed to do was try um, sort of a little bit more um, objective and certainly less, um, less direct um, sort of hand picking of seismograms approach to um, both detecting and locating these earthquakes. And so this is something that um, Steve Hansen, uh, now at Macquarie, put together that um, used the array for um, what you could call back projection or reverse time imaging of micro seismicity. And so there's um, some uh, well, video over on the right, and what the video is showing is um, this set of about 20 seconds, and it's slowed down by a factor of uh, seven or so from, from real time. And what it's doing is taking all the seismograms we recorded at those 900 sites and basically playing them into a 3D model of the subsurface. So we could um, similarly think about, say, you guys listening to me, and if at the end of the hour we turned you into speakers and you started playing all the sound backward, the only place it would stack up constructively is where I'm standing. So in this case, it's kind of a brute force approach of looking at where seismic energy originated is to um, play it back into the subsurface. And so when we do that, um, you see the energy move around. And when it reaches um, its maximum, a local maximum in the time series, um, that's where we estimate the origin of the earthquake um, spatially and temporally. And so for the big events, we get um, locations that are very consistent with um, the, the manually picked arrivals from PNSN. So that last one is this big event that would have been detected by PNSN anyway. And the earlier two are events that we would have detected with back projection um, that wouldn't normally have been seen. So what these look like, um, in this case, this really is a pretty small earthquake. This is about a magnitude negative 0.2 earthquake. And um, with that kind of array, you can really still localize it within um, a couple of kilometers. Our horizontal locations are very tightly constrained because we have these things surrounded at 360 degrees of azimuth. They're only P arrivals, so there's, there's a bit more uncertainty. You see that the energy is more streaked out in depth. Um, if we had, say, S minus P times, as we're, we're aiming to do with the new three-component array, um, then you could tighten that up um, considerably in depth. So what do you get out of this? Um, there are times that I think are you know, it, straightforward. They show it's working, but maybe kind of boring in that if you look at this sort of histogram view of, of earthquakes through time, a day like this one, you see more earthquakes on the PNSN network in red. You see more earthquakes than that in the black bar. And so um, we kind of already knew there's elevated seismicity that day, and we see more of it. Um, as you move your detection level down in terms of um, earthquakes, you, as you move down one unit of magnitude, you expect to detect about an order of magnitude more earthquakes. Uh, and that's, that's generally what we see. But there are also kind of curious events like all the way at the end of this, where in this period of about 18 hours, the, the PNSN would have detected two earthquakes, whereas we'd see something like 80. So this did not really look like a cluster of activity. Uh, so this is one that's made out of basically all little earthquakes and no bigger earthquakes. Um, so there are some different things that you can pick up in this way, and you end up with um, something close to um, an order of magnitude kind of increase in um, the detection without any um, sort of manual intervention in, uh, in using this. The event distribution is kind of interesting. Um, the way that they were back projected, you see all these little squares. This is in map view. This is the, that inner ring of um, seismometers. And in map view, we get the greatest clustering of these events in just two of those 500 meter pixels. 
Um, so north-south, a very tight um, sort of sub-vertical conduit of seismicity, and then a, a little bit wider east-west. If we were to look at a, a west-east cross-section, we get some view here. Um, so it looks like these things are um, extremely near vertical. Um, you see that peak in seismicity that's at about um, two and a half or three kilometers depth. This is where it was most frequent during our experiment, much like it is during longer time periods at Mount St. Helens. Um, this, this green circle is where Waite and Moran had, had previously imaged a, a bit of low P velocity from seismic tomography. Um, it looks like the, the peak of seismicity beneath Mount St. Helens is parked pretty much in the middle of that. So, a little resistant to think that it's actually a shallow magma chamber of, of silicate melt, but maybe likely higher porosity um, of, of gas or fluids at that location. But we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about the um, magma plumbing system um, in, the, in the next bit of the talk. Um, a couple more things that I'd like to mention about the earthquake activity there. One is this back projection. Um, I look at it as more of a starting point than um, kind of an ending point for looking at the seismicity um, in that we automatically get these you know, somewhat crude estimates. They're, well, they're at least as good as the hand-picked estimates, um, but we have more earthquakes. What we've gone on to do is then use those as templates, and that's something that's been um, powerful in seismology in recent years, that we could look at a seismogram as a sort of um, idiosyncratic signature and say, all right, we saw one earthquake that looked like this, how about we run that signature through all of our time series and see if it shows up again. And so if we do that, we can start to get other statistically significant peaks um, by correlation, and in that same two and a half win minute window I showed earlier, we can pick up, say, nine new events through using those um, template matching techniques. If we do that through the whole two weeks, we end up with about a thousand events at Mount St. Helens. So for a very short-term array, you can kind of look at this volcano and, and learn which parts of it are seismically active and which parts are not in a couple of weeks. You don't necessarily need a long-term network to do that right away, or say you're going to a volcano where there's not a, a long history of study and you want to know, how should we design an array? Which parts of the sy system are active and which parts are not? You might be able to get quite a bit of traction on that in just a couple of weeks with a rapidly deployable, pretty cheap array. Uh, the next topic is to take a look at some of these deep long period earthquakes. Um, unusual things that, that primarily happen beneath volcanoes, although there are some interesting reports of them happening uh, beneath other places, like Eugene. Um, so we'll, we'll take a look at those. We're lucky to um, catch a couple of them. Requires Introducing what a, uh, a deep long period earthquake is. Um, one, they're deeper in the crust, and two, they lack their high frequency, so the name's pretty straightforward. But if we wanted to look at this in a quantitative way, here's what I'd call a normal earthquake, or when a normal earthquake's parked near a volcano, we call it a volcanic tectonic earthquake. Um, nice flat line, bang, there's a, an impulsive P arrival energy dies down, then there's an S arrival, that's our typical one. And if we look at it in a spectrogram, this goes from 1 to 25 hertz, we can see that it's pretty broad band. It's sort of quiet here, and then when the P wave comes, it excites the whole range from 1 to 25 hertz, similarly for the S wave. A deep long period event, I would say this is a classy looking deep long period event. Uh, most of them look terrible in comparison, uh, especially at a place like Mount St. Helens, but uh, you have to choose a nice one to put in the paper, and I think it's a nice comparison from, from Nichols and others who sort of surveyed deep long period seismicity along the whole Cascade arc. You see that it's not quite as impulsive in onset, although well, this one's pretty impulsive in, in DLP world. And you see that it's pretty low frequency. You can kind of see all of these zero crossings back and forth in the seismogram. And it's a very long event, similar amplitude for more than 20 seconds. Uh, so not nearly as impulsive as the one above it. You see that its most energy is mostly below perhaps uh, 5 or 7 hertz. Um, many different origins hypothesized for these. Um, some of them are more straightforward than others. Um, almost all of them involve some element of fluid transport, thinking of things like um, 
moving magma through a conduit or opening and closing cavities or contraction of intrusions have all been, been brought up as um, sources of deep long period earthquakes. At St. Helens, this is again from, from Nichols et al., um, they tend to cluster southeast of Mount St. Helens. Um, something we've learned much more recently is that almost all of these should actually be collapsed to one point at about 25 kilometers beneath Mount St. Helens. There are some that extend deeper, um, but they make up a really small fraction of the deep long period seismicity. Um, and that, that's worked mostly from, from template matching um, with the broadband IMUSH data. Uh, but they're in the deep crust southeast of Mount St. Helens. So sort of in map view, they're offset, and this is where um, one of the two that we saw was observed. How deep is the Moho there? Are they even in the crust? Yeah, so how deep is the Moho there and are they in the crust? Um, the 25 kilometer cluster that repeats is certainly in the crust. The Moho is about 40 kilometers deep. And then there is a one deep long period earthquake during our array that was at about 38 kilometers, so extremely close to the Moho. Um, so they, they do get to right around that boundary. Um, Long period earthquakes with 10 hertz geophones. Um, there, to some seismologists, that would not sound like um, the right tool for the job. And I'd argue that there, there's some value in the spatial sampling. Um, and that we might see some different things that way. And so just as kind of a comparison, if we look at regional network waveforms, we could look at sort of our, our fanciest seismometers. You drill a nice borehole, put uh, a three component seismometer down there. And you can see here's your you know, completely obvious P wave arrival, followed by uh, the S wave, a shallow vault station near Mount St. Helens in the wilderness. That's the P arrival, that's the S. Um, so maybe not an overwhelming amount of energy. This is another shallow vault station. The PNSN folks didn't do it, so I won't dare to. Um, you know, you'd have to have a bit of vision to actually get these things right. Um, this is doing something really crude with a cluster of 30 nodes that was at a trail intersection um, near Mount St. Helens. And all we did was stack a median envelope, or you know, take the median of um, those, those 36 nodes and um, average that, or well, take the, the median rather than the average, um, just a way of getting rid of some of the outliers. But you see sort of a background noise level, and then an abrupt jump. That's your P arrival. You have about four and a half or five seconds later, energy is decaying, and then your S arrival comes in, and you can actually measure an S minus P time on deep long period earthquakes, which is almost never possible. And so you can locate these um, with much greater accuracy. If you wanted to confirm to yourself that these are actually P and S waves, we only have vertical seismometers, so we can't look at three component polarization, but we can beam form and see that one of them is going about 1.7 times faster than the other. Um, so this is kind of matching our, our expectations. So if you're looking at, say, more exotic seismic events, your ability to um, objectively identify the seismic phases that you're seeing is, is certainly helpful, and your ability to pull an S wave out of the coda is quite helpful. If you remember, this was our um, nice enough example that you want to show it off in a paper of a DLP seismogram. Picking the S wave arrival on here is, is probably not possible. And so often we don't really know the locations of these things and they might lead us to um, sort of misrepresenting uh, the structures that, that host these earthquakes at depth. Other games that um, we can play are uh, different types of, of sort of spatial filtering. So these are the 1 to 5 hertz filtered waveforms for the, the stronger deep long period earthquake we observed. Um, you see something in there. There's our P wave and there's our S wave, but it's, it's, it's a bit rough. This is actually an interfering signal from somewhere else that is um, poorly timed. Uh, P, S. You can apply some um, spatial filtering approaches. In this case, a, a curvilet transform that tries to bring out um, wave-shaped features in these seismograms. And so it tries to bring out these coherent features. And what we see is actually a pretty sharp and simple P wave. You could do the same thing by stacking seismograms in dense subsets of the array. And at least from the P wave, it doesn't appear that this is a long duration event at all. Most of its coda seems to be purely path effect, um, which does not fit with generally how um, people think about deep long period earthquakes here or, or elsewhere. Um, much stronger coda coming in from the S wave. 
Um, so again, different approaches you can take if you have the, the spatial density um, of sampling rather than just a few points with a, a much lower, or a much, a instrument with a much lower noise floor. Brandon, that's for your entire array. This is the 900 left to right. Yep. Yeah, and so, you know, cheating a bit to say that we could apply a curvelet transform sort of blindly because we'd be saying that polarity doesn't change around the array. It also doesn't really look to change in the seismogram, so that's sort of spot checked, but you couldn't necessarily do that all the time. You might want to choose a, a subset so you know you're not on a, on a nodal plane. Does it, does it depend on how you sort them? How you sort the traces in the image? Well, these are sorted by distance, so we're assuming a 1D wave field, so you're just looking at, at move out with, with distance from the event. And so the, the curvelet can handle the move, the bridge will move out. Yeah, that's, that's what it's made for. And you can have curved waves. It's, it's very happy with that. This just looks pretty linear because it's so deep beneath the array. Um, you could apply this sort of back projection to deep long period earthquakes and sort of uh, get much better locations. So this shallower cluster, um, for instance, we know now that it's been repeating for decades beneath Mount St. Helens, so we might want to know where it's located and, rel and relocate other events with respect to it. Um, so using it, um, using the, the node array, we could um, back project both the P and the S energy and get a pretty localized estimate of where the source is. This one's at about 27 or 28 kilometers depth, um, and then this other one was at about 37, so getting pretty close to the MOHO. Um, we also saw some unexpected low frequency earthquakes, low frequency or long period, as, as however you like. Um, this is work from, from Margaret Glasgow, and again, this is our sort of normal or uh, volcanic tectonic earthquake, which is three seconds in both of these images. These low frequency earthquakes that we were seeing um, are actually shallow and in the upper crust. And this is something that Mount St. Helens is not generally thought to do between eruptive phases. Um, but they don't have much energy above 10 hertz and they last for quite a while. You can see a pretty striking difference in these if you look at spectrograms. So this is frequency from 1 to 100 hertz. And then you're looking at time increasing going downward here. So this is a normal one again. And on our, our um, seismograms here, we can see energy excited all the way from 1 to 100 hertz. So they're very broadband events. And then this is one of the low frequency events um, where it's really strongest below about 10 hertz and it lasts much longer. So a very different type of event. And at first, um, Margaret was very excited to show these to the folks at, at CDO, and they said, oh, well, well, those are all rock fault, they're not earthquakes. Um, and so we thought, darn, that's, that's, that's boring, but maybe we should take a, a, a better look. Um, and so we, we started looking at um, some known rock fall events, and if we were to beam form with these, it's sort of a seismic technique where you see the direction a wave is coming from, and its slowness, or the, the inverse of its speed. And so for this event, which is a known rock fall, you see it moving at a few kilometers per second. And um, so it plots out a little farther. Faster velocities would plot toward the center. And it's, um, this is off to the southwest of Mount St. Helens. So we expect the source to be coming from the, the northeast. Um, so that's a rock fall. Um, these were the, uh, one, this is an example of one of the long period or low frequency earthquakes. And many of them were coming in with apparent velocities of 7 to 12 kilometers per second. The upper crustal velocity at Mount St. Helens is um, low. We could generously say 6 kilometers per second or lower. If you want things to come in faster, they have to come from beneath you. So they would hit multiple stations in a short amount of time. Um, so these things are, are pretty obviously coming from somewhere downstairs. And in some cases, you could pick up that they do have P and S arrivals once, once you beam form. Um, a lot of long period earthquakes at volcanoes are thought to be um, harmonic and explained by fluids resonating in cracks. Um, there are all, there's also increasing evidence in recent years that there are a lot of low frequency earthquakes that are not harmonic and are definitely not uh, fluids resonating in cracks. Um, these earthquakes, the LP ones, are mixed up right with the, the BT ones. And if we look at their spectra, they're smooth. 
um, rather than um, harmonic. Uh, so you could fit these like normal um, earthquakes or say normal fault slip shear failure events. You just have to um, either reduce the, the stress drop or slow down the rupture velocity in order to um, get rid of the high frequency content. For comparison, this is um, sort of a, a, a booming example of a resonant LP source, um, in this case from Kilauea, so a very different setting, but um, one where there's a degassing burst, and so we know very well it's fluid moving through some kind of conduit. And you see these sort of order of magnitude peaks and then troughs that, that show you it's very clearly a harmonic signal. Um, this is, is probably quite a different thing, and it's going on in the depth range we'd estimate to be basically beneath the, the major magma reservoir at Mount St. Helens is thought to be below about five kilometers depth. So this is kind of in this conduit environment between that reservoir and um, the summit crater. Uh, so an interesting place to take a look um, with help from Amanda um, Thomas here and uh, Wes Thalen and Seth Moran at, at CVO. We deployed an array last summer to kind of zoom in on these sources and, and test some other questions um, related to edifice structure. And so in this case, we had seismometers in the summit crater, in the breach, and around the inner ring again, um, but all three component sensors. So we could do both P and S wave analysis, and um, so we're excited to, to work on that. So the last part here is to look at um, some structural imaging to get a sense of the magmatic system at Mount St. Helens. And one part of it is from uh, reflection imaging, where we could look at um, whether there even are reflections in this wave field. That was one of the thought aspects of the IMUSH proposal I found interesting, was that they figured in most volcanic settings, you don't get clear reflections. There's such a long coda after the P wave that you kind of give up on reflection processing on land. Um, so that was the first thing I had my intro seismology class look at, was what kind of phases were in here, and could we see any reflections? So this is our um, way of arranging the data. Time increasing down, distance increasing to the right. Here's our uh, P wave, S wave. And then later is um, this, this um, PMP or, or, or compressional wave reflected off the MOHO. So it has this hyperbolic geometry we'd expect for a reflection. It's coming in about the right time. Sorry, it, Brendan, I spaced out. It, this is for the shot? Yeah. So, the shot? This is for half of the shots, actually. Um, so there are several thousand seismograms stacked here, and they're um, short-term over long-term averages, which show a sort of changing energy in the coda of the, the direct arrival. Um, another, kind of a simpler way to look at this is to look at individual shot records. So each individual shot would have a couple thousand seismograms recording it in close by the mountain. So we're only going to look at the seismograms real close. If we look at these three shots on the east side of Mount St. Helens, these are what we call uh, normal move out corrected stacks. It just means that you're seeing reflectivity as a function of depth. So if there's a big reflector that's everywhere at 40 kilometers depth, like the crust mantle boundary, you'd see a big peak there. Um, and indeed, that's kind of what we see, and that's exactly what um, we'd expect. But if we go just to the other side of the array, which is only a little over 20 kilometers wide, and we look at these, there's basically nothing. Um, kind of sobering to me, because I spent, uh, still spend much of my career looking at data from stations that are you know, 50 or 100 kilometers apart, and assuming that there's this you know, continuous interface structure between them. Um, and so in this case, we have sort of a normal full brightness moho over here, and uh, nothing over here. And those reflections would be half the distance apart. All these reflections would be right here. The ones with full moho would be right over there. Um, so we can see this is changing over pretty short distances. We're not, um, by any means, the first people to observe um, decreased reflectivity of the moho in um, a subduction environment or Cascadia. And all of these green boxes along the Cascadia margin are places where people have inferred a sort of weak moho or or possibly even inverted, meaning velocity would decrease across the MOHO. And what I think is um, that our, our little postage stamp array, it happens to be perched right at the edge of one of those low free reflectivity boundaries and gives us an idea that it is extremely sharp and um, 
likely consistent with the interpretation that this is the cold, hydrated um, wedge corner where um, serpentinization has greatly reduced mantle velocities um, and basically erased the moho. One other cool aspect of this is that if it is compositional, then we're actually looking at, in this case, likely the integrate phase boundary. So we could go to um, experimental uh, trilogy and look at this and say, well, at about our, our right pressure or depth, um, what temperature would it have to be so that we're parked at the phase boundary? And so if this is at all right, and we're looking at the edge of integrite stability, this is a 700 degree isotherm that, that we're mapping beneath the array. Um, so kind of interesting to be able to gauge the temperature anywhere, um, especially beneath an arc volcano. These are the, the deep long period events in the, in the deep crust at Mount St. Helens again. And so to kind of see if this is feasible, this is um, a thermal model from Ellen Syracuse that's tailored to the central cascades. And so for this central cascades thermal model, we've just sort of shaded in with these wavy lines the area where um, uh, hydrated minerals would be stable in the mantle wedge. So having these die out in basically a, a near vertical wall beneath Mount St. Helens is not too far-fetched because St. Helens sits so far out into the fork, um, well west of the ax normal axis of the Cascades Arc, which would be um, the, the area where Mount Adams is located here. So in this case, the, the sharp contrast and reflectivity could give us some nice insight that we probably are looking at a compositional boundary it has to that change has to occur over only about five or so kilometers distance laterally and uh, it uh, at least roughly fits with the thermal structure we'd expect for the cascades uh, how this might tie in with supplying melt to mount st helens is sort of interesting melts as hot as 900 degrees have come out the top of this mountain and so in a way it's a little bit wild to say that directly beneath mount st helens it's 700 degrees um, but actually fits pretty well with the active source tomography imaging. So this is travel time tomography from Eric Kaiser, who's um, now on the faculty at University of Arizona. And um, I'd probably look at this image down on the, the, the lower right. Um, this one's from northwest to southeast, a cross section beneath um, uh, a densely sampled part of the array. And the main thing that he sees in the deep crust um, is that the lowest velocities are actually offset from Mount St. Helens by about 20 kilometers um, to, the, to the east. So these are the deep long period earthquakes again that seem to cluster at about the edge of this high velocity to low velocity um, transition in the lower crust. And then um, the, the seismicity shallower in the crust um, is basically near vertical beneath Mount St. Helens. This other little blob here called F1 is a, is a high VPVS volume that, that Eric's tomography also identified where we think of that as the shallowest magma reservoir at Mount St. Helens. So it's likely that the um, primitive melts entering the crust at Mount St. Helens are entering offset to the east um, near where the mantle is much hotter and then making it up through the crust in a sort of up into the west trajectory. And so on this thermal model, we've put in Eric's low velocity zone in the lower crust, and we kind of suggest that melts are, are taking a sort of up into the west path from the hot part of the mantle wedge um, into the crust um, just a little east of Mount St. Helens. If you're curious about the A path, this is in, in some ways in, in deference to uh, an earlier magnetotelluric study that suggested maybe there's a, a common mid-crustal connection between Mount St. Helens and Mount Adams um, from conductivity structure. We really haven't seen that seismically. Um, there is a big conductive feature there, um, but I would say it's more likely that the silicate melt is um, entering the crust here and then making its way shallower. Um, and the, the shallowest part of the magmatic system is probably best illuminated by the frequent seismicity above this um, magma reservoir. Um, so if we were to just look at some pieces of the Mount St. Helens magmatic system, um, I'd have that, that shallow conduit structure that's maybe 500 meters to about a kilometer wide, um, at least where it's seismically active. That gets down to about five kilometers where the seismicity greatly decreases in density. Um, that would fit pretty well with the, the petrologic estimates of where melts um, that erupted in 1980 last equilibrated, mostly between about 5 and 12 kilometers depth. 
So this is um, a, a pretty reasonable neighborhood to find the high BPVS anomaly. And then much deeper in the crust, we see another localized feature. So this is probably more of our sort of processing zone where uh, melts are converted. I haven't really looked at the, uh, maybe not the best representative to present the, the petrologic aspects of IMUSH um, from Olivier Bachman's group, um, but this is sort of their interpretation that we have these two magmatic reservoirs. One, that's really our, our sort of processing zone of, of differentiation that turns these primitive basalts to um, compositions more like the day site that erupts. That accumulates in the upper crust and then eventually drives eruptions at Mount St. Helens. Um, so we think this, this deep structure fits pretty well with separating the, the hot convecting mantle just off to the east of Mount St. Helens with uh, a, a very cold hydrated wedge just to the west of it. Um, so I will um, mostly stop there, but just one last thing is to, to thank um, the field workers. Um, this was definitely an exciting project for me in getting seismology going at the um, University of New Mexico. Uh, seven of the students got to go right into seismology class afterward and uh, largely use the data from Mount St. Helens for most of that semester. Um, and I appreciate the support. Different parts of the project um, have been supported by geoprisms, earthscope, and geophysics. I think my part actually came from earthscope and not um, geoprisms, but neither here nor there, the whole package um, was uh, supported by a variety of programs at NSF. Um, so hopefully that stirred up a few questions, and I'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Yep. Would you care to speculate on why those magmas are being deflected to the west from that low velocity zone in the lower crust? Um, yeah, I know that some people like to think about like loading on the surface or things like that. But I was wondering what you might be able to what you might be able to say. Yeah, so if the if the magma enters here, why does it bother going up into the uh, to the west? Um, the main reason it's entering there, I'd say, is where it's hot enough. One related aspect that um, at least. Um, Eric and, and Alan and uh, Olivier have certainly entertained as this relates to this high velocity body that is over to the west. Um, in part, they think that this might be guiding the melt, that this is actually um, a, a dense high velocity body of, of cumulates from prior differentiation. So, as you take basaltic melt here and um, differentiate it to get day site out, you leave behind. Um, accumulates like this that might be an obstacle to further melt ascending. Um, one of the other big aspects that to the position of Mount St. Helens that I, I haven't talked about here is that the, um, the St. Helens seismic zone is a, a right lateral deformation zone. Um, generally in Cascadia, the, the coastal block is moving north with respect to the arc. And there are some areas of more focused strain that accommodate that coastal block moving north. And so coming north and south out of Mount St. Helens are um, earthquakes in the crust that are consistent with right lateral deformation. And so maybe that shear deformation is helping guide where it's easiest for melts to make it out. Um, we see a similar shear zone very close to Mount Rainier. And so it's likely that the position of volcanoes in Cascadia um, is uh, controlled not just by melt input at the base of the crust, but also by tectonic strain um, within the crust. So those those would be my best guesses, but they, they are that. They are guesses. Yep. What's going on between 10 and 30 kilometers depth? Not as much. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I... I uh, Simple view, if, if most of the differentiation is taking place down here, then the more buoyant melts take a quick ride through the middle crust and again reach neutral buoyancy somewhere um, shallower. Why there isn't an intermediate stage? Um, I'm not quite sure. That, that might be more linked to, say, changes in crustal rheology, um, areas where it's easier for melt to accumulate, areas where it moves through quickly. Um, but that's I would say a pattern that I'm seeing at more and more magmatic systems is that we tend to see uh, evidence of magma reservoirs deep in the crust and shallower and less right in the middle. Um, so that's, that's something I'd very much like to understand um, and 
I don't know, but I, I would worry quite a bit about say, changes in, in the crustal rheology. Uh, yeah. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sure. The, the two and a half kilobar number that you get for magma equilibration at Mount St. Helens is seen in a lot of other systems around the world, from ranging from the Fish Canyon magma, huge system, to other arc volcanoes. So that seems to, for whatever reasons, that seems to be the, the happy spot for Hornblown Day site to, Hornblown Berry Day site to, to find its neutral buoyancy spot. Um, and I'd just like to comment on your, your suggestion about uh, faults in the, the, in, this, in the southern Andes, where I worked a lot. The, the, uh, the very large faults that are obvious at the surface, well, the Kiniaki faults and so on and so forth, those things really control the positions of volcanoes. And so I think there, in other arcs where the, the, ex the surface expression of these lithosphere scale structures is more evident, the, the localization of the volcanoes along those faults is increasingly obvious. And so it's not unlikely that, that in some way lithosphere, lithosphere scale faulting, um, the kind of thing you described, is, is a very important aspect of this. Are they in releasing bins? Are, are the volcanoes in releasing in, bins? In many of them are, yes. In some cases, they're in, in inter, like Villa Rica, which is a very active volcano. It's at the intersection of the Kiniaki and, and a northwest trending fault. And so there, there's a chain of volcanoes behind the Eureka that follows that northwest trending fault. And there are a bunch of minor eruptive centers along the Kiniaki next to the Eureka. And as you go north of that to Jaima, then you're at a releasing bend, the Jaima's in a half drop, and then blah, blah, blah. It continues on for a while until the Kiniaki dies out. And then some other system of grabbings coming out of Argentina. Uh, locates the other guys. And, and so, uh, in that particular case, it's really obvious. When you get up no farther north and where the crust is really, really thick, then it's not, you know, then you start to lose that obvious factor. Yeah, here it might be somewhere in the middle. I mean, the strain rates on these, these zones that of right lateral deformation in Cascadia, we see them, um, but they're not necessarily big offsets in the northward rate of motion as you move across the system and it's as far as I know not necessarily obvious as a discrete system at the surface but one we more identify by seismogenic deformation at depth and sort of a smooth change in the northward gradient of um, GPS motions and things like that. Yeah. Um, all things considered if you get a, a large pre-existing fault it seems to me likely that that's an easier magma conduit than a place where the, the crust has been sitting there. So do you know that they're pre-existing? Did the fault make the volcano? I have no the idea if the fault's fault. more than 300,000 years old, which is kind of an, uh, an estimate for about how long um, the structure about like Mount St. Helens has been erupting there. Um, that, that's, that's probably moving around through time, but I would guess that that, that northward transport of the coast ranges is pretty steady than something we see from paleomagnetism that on geologic time scales it's been doing that for quite a while obviously with different resolution than plate boundary observatory gps but the coastal block's been moving north a long time so um, it's probably old good time i guess i'm wondering what the pmp waveforms look like do they look like the direct arrivals they look awful individually. Without stacking hundreds to thousands of them, your chance of seeing them is nothing. So they didn't phase inverted. How do you know it's a jump in velocity, not a decrease in velocity? These are picked up off um, STA-LTA functions, so we've destroyed their polarity. Um, and so we don't know that. Um, one other way that we could look at these features, which, yeah, I have it deleted. That's good. Um, is say to um, see if they're consistent with a lot lower resolution data, but uh, very different types. So these are inversions from uh, Weiss and Shen uh, and others using surface wave dispersion and receiver functions. And using those, if we were to look at the two nearest transportable array broadband stations, the red one out here just northeast of Mount St. Helens, would show that there's a big jump in, uh, 
big jump in velocity at the moho, a uh, little bit of a faster lid, and then velocities decrease again um, deeper um, as, as we might expect beneath the arc. If we were to look at these kind of inversions um, at uh, closer to a four arc position like where Mount St. Helens is, they basically see no moho in the receiver functions, but just a smooth velocity increase with depth. Um, so I think there's a feature out here that's quite consistent where we see the strong reflections. There's other evidence that there's a sharp um, interface below which velocities increase. Um, things get murkier when you have no clear signal to I the west. I guess none of those are really close to a volcano either, and so you know, I'm wondering about melt pulling near the base of the cross. How would you, you know, how would you know, can you eliminate that? For Mount St. Helens, it's, it's a pretty broad area out here, so we can go farther away and we would still see PMP reflections out here, and we'd see them out here, okay. and we could trace them continuously into Mount St. Helens. So maybe the, the origin of that interface changes dramatically, um, but, but I, I guess the, I would tend to ascribe the interface as it goes west to um, the same origin of being the boundary between the crust and the mail. Well, aren't we that Ray had a question, maybe Ben, but if anybody wants to leave, maybe right now is a good time to break and then I'll continue to speak questions.